Hey guys, Woodruff here. So um, getting into what everyone knows to be my least favorite topic, you're in eye disorders. Um, if you know, if it, you're really offended by that fact, um, you know, you can keep scrolling, but these videos will have some helpful thing on ear and eye disorders. I'm going to break it down. This is my long lecture. I'm going to break it down into each individual disorder or problem when it comes to ear and eye problems. Um, so if you're wondering, because people always ask, why is this my least favorite thing? Um, to me, I just find it very boring. It's not something I see a lot in practice. Like these are maybe chronic issues, but not really something that usually gets someone into the ICU. Um, and that's kind of funny, like I see you, <laughs> um, but needless to say, uh, if you didn't get the joke, just keep moving on. Um, but, uh, yeah, it's just, it's not my, it's not the worst thing in the world. I'm coming around to it. There's some kind of interesting stuff about sight and hearing, but it's just not my favorite cup of tea. Um, but I will still teach it with the same rigor. Like I teach everything else. So don't worry. So let's get started. So we're going to start by talking about what is normal with the eye, and then we're going to talk in this video specifically about sight loss or um, vision issues. So what is normal? Like as a nurse, what am I looking at when I'm looking at people's eyes and, um, you know, what kind of assessments am I doing? Um, as a whole, what I'm looking for is I'm looking to see um, if they have normal visual acuity. And this is not something I've ever done as a nurse, but, you know, depending on where you work, you might check test visual acuity, um, see how well people can um, read things from far away or see things close up. Um, 2020 is what's considered normal. We also would expect people not to have double vision. They shouldn't be seeing two of things. There should be no drainage coming from their eye. You know, if they are having drainage, like a little bit of clear um, drainage or some tearing might be okay, but they shouldn't be having especially any purulent drainage or um, really there shouldn't be a lot of drainage from the eyes. The conjunctiva um, should be clear and the conjunctiva um, is the lining underneath the eye if you pull it down. Um, that should be clear. Um, the sclera, which is the white part of the eye, um, should be white. Uh, so like, as you can see, I should should point to her eye because my eyes, you won't be able to see them from this far. But um, the sclera should be white. The lens should be clear. In other words, there should be no cloudiness. We'll talk about what happens when that is abnormal. Um, they should have perla. Um, so that's the pupils are equal and round and reactive to light in a combination, which means that when light goes into my eye that it normally it should um, constrict like usually it's more dilated um, in darker spaces and then as light appears, um, it constricts to adjust to light so I should see a difference when I put a flashlight into someone's eye. And then extraocular movements intact in other words that I can move my eye side to side and up and down. I don't know why my cat always starts sneezing as soon as I start these videos. Anyway, so let's talk about vision loss. Another name you might see this referred to as is a refractive error. Um, there's a couple different types of vision loss issues. Um, first is what's known as myopia, and this is probably um, what's most common or what you're going to see most often. Um, and this is what's called nearsightedness. And anytime you see something is like nearsighted or farsighted, that's saying what they can see, not what they're missing. So if I am nearsighted, I have trouble seeing far away. If I'm farsighted, I have trouble seeing up close. Um, so uh, I am, I have myopia. These are not fancy, um, you know, glasses. They are just um, the blue light glasses because I went blind since COVID. My astigmatism got significantly worse, um, but I wear contacts um, or very, very thick. It's real, it's really attractive look um, for my glasses. Um, they're very, very thick, like so thick that almost like a frame can't hold them. Um, and because I have really bad myop myopia, you know, to the point where I can't even get, you know, LASIK and other surgeries now um, because the severity of it. Um, but um, yeah, so like I'm having myopia, like um, if I take my contacts out, I can hold something close to my face and read it, but I cannot see far away. So that's why I can see myself, but I cannot see far away. Um, hyperopia is farsightedness and this happens to where people can see far away no issues but they can't like they need like reading glasses or they can't um, see up close um, then presbyopia is what we how we refer to people as they get older everyone's vision gets worse um, so presbyopia is um, an age-related vision loss so it's not about whether it's seeing far away or up close it's just general vision loss because of age um, 
And then astigmatism, like I mentioned, is something I have, which, um, you know, you want to think about blurry at all distances. So for example, um, when I, uh, what do you call them? Even with like my contacts correct for the astigmatism, but sometimes um, I still see like every, like kind of everything is fuzzy around the end sometimes, or especially if I take my contacts out, um, everything is not only blurry, um, but it also kind of looks fuzzy around the edges. Um, so um, this is one way to maybe remember that. Um, now we're not going to test you deep about these. I would want to know the differences. And I'm when I time I'm talking about testing and stuff, I'm talking about for my school, if you're one of my students, but um, we you know if you saw a question, it might like mention, I would want to know what the difference between myopia and hyperopia and presbyopia is. We don't go too, too in depth or there's not like going to be something we can test you over when it comes to, oh, a patient has astigmatism, like what, like, you know, like you have to be a deep eye doctor or anything. So um, when someone has vision loss, what are my priority assessments or questions I'm going to ask? Mostly I'm just checking visual acuity, um, but there's some questions that might help me get more information. So I might want to ask them, was it a sudden vision change or was it more gradual? Um, all the three disorders that we're going to talk about um, for eye disorders, they all are a little bit different in their, um, they're all about vision loss usually at some point, but you want to know like what's happening around it. Was it fast or was it slow? I want to know what makes it better or worse. Um, so what things um, improve the vision, what things uh, make the vision decline, is there anything that does make it better? Um, is there a certain time of day um, or is it all the time? So, you know, like with some things, like when we talk about cataracts, um, some people usually experience those that it's worse at night, they have a glare at night, excuse me. Um, whereas uh, patients, um, you know, that have general vision loss, it's going to be all the time. Uh, and then we want to, again, kind of assess, is it like, are they having trouble seeing stuff all the time, like anything, or is it just when stuff's far away or close up? Um, is there any other symptoms with the vision change? Is it just um, a vision change or is there pain, discomfort, halos, um, loss of peripheral vision, you know, a variety of stuff can happen. So we want to kind of see if there's any other symptoms associated with it. And then ask about their day-to-day, because -day, we also want to look at their risk factors. Do they spend a lot of time looking at screens? Hence, my lovely glasses here. <laughs> what do they do for work? Um, so I know a patient um, with eye problems is getting better if their vision improves or if they have improvement of other symptoms, if they have other symptoms present. Of course, they're getting worse if their vision declines or they have a worsening of their symptoms. Um, the biggest concern we have for eyes and ears, the reason that we study it is because it's all about safety. This is one of your senses. And so you want to think about how me not being able to see affects, um, you know, my ability to, um, you know, interact and live in this world safely. See if I can get this going. There you go. So medically, what we can do for vision loss, um, like we talked about, we can do glasses or contact lenses. There's reading glasses. There's what's known as bifocals. So if you can't see far away, and when I talked about, you know, myopia and myopia and hyperopia, um, you know, I might have made it seem like, you know, like it's there are two separate things. You either have one or the other, but you can actually have both, where you can't see far away or close up. And that's when you need something like bifocals, where it has like it has the full glasses to see far away, and then there's like a little you'll see like a little cutout in them and that's to see up close. Um, then there's also a magnifier. Some people they just have that have trouble seeing up close. They just literally use a magnifying glass. It's also a really cute look. Um, contact lenses offer greater comfort, but one um, downside is we're literally touching something we're putting in our eyes. So there's a high chance of infection, other, not high chance, but there isn't a chance of infection if poor hygiene practices. Um, so you want to be super careful and you want to teach them about how to do that. We'll talk about it. Um, then, like I mentioned, there is what's called LASIK, which is a, the laser, a, a laser can sculpt your cornea to re, um, like remove your refractive error, get you back to normal vision. Um, not everyone can get it. Like I said, I do not apply anymore. I think it's mostly, it's less about my, how bad my vision is. And it's cause I don't, I'm not at the point, like um, some people are at the point that their contact prescription or their glasses prescription is so high. They could be considered legally blind. I'm not there, but I have a very high astigmatism. And so that's why for me, for the LASIK, the LASIK won't work for me. Um, but yeah, so this is one option that people can get. There's also what's known as a lens implant where they can take out my lens or um, uh, or place, you know, like a, they get like a, a donor 
um, and they place that lens in front of um, my lens or leave, like leave my old lens in and put a new one in front of it. So think of this like an implantable contact lens. All right, let's do an application question. Which interventions are appropriate to include for a client with severe visual loss? Select all that apply. So going back to the question, I'm looking for what is right or what is appropriate. And I'm, I'm looking for a client with severe visual loss. So they have a very high amount of visual loss. So I'm um, going to select all that apply. And so every class is different. Some classes will allow just one answer. Some will be all five. Usually in my class, we do, you know, um, two to four, like, you know, it's not, it's going to be usually at least two, um, or um, it's not usually going to be all of them, but just know in other classes, they love to play that game. So um, just be prepared. So uh, let's see. Answer choice A says, if ambulating the cliently, the cliently, <laughs> if ambulating the client walks slightly ahead of them. So this has to do with a safety thing. So it's saying if I'm ambulating, the client walks slightly ahead of them. Well, this would maybe be helpful because if I'm walking ahead of them, um, I can help to kind of be their guide to if there's any obstacles in their path, I can warn them ahead of time. So this seems to sound um, sound right because I don't want to walk behind them because they can't see where they're going. I know a lot of people probably say walk next to them, um, but you know most of the time we walk slightly ahead of them and give them our arm um, just to kind of hold on to, um, you know, to kind of help be a guide for them. So I'm going to say yes to A. Um, use exaggerated gestures in order to support your communication. Hmm. So this patient has a visual problem. So this is what I want you to think of. We're talking about vision and hearing issues. If someone has a visual problem, we're going to help them be more safe with communication, like think verbal. Um, and if someone has a hearing problem, no amount of verbal is going to help. So I need something more visual. So these are kind of backwards. So if I have a patient that has a severe visual loss, if I'm using exaggerated gestures, that's not necessarily going to help because they can't see the gestures. They have severe visual loss. So I don't think that's going to be very appropriate or helpful to them. Um, and the exaggerated gestures, like I could sit there all the day and like shake my arms, but if they can't see it, they can't see it. As someone who, when I take my contacts out, people can move around and I can see their body, body images moving around, but I can't really tell Tell the fine motor things they're doing, gestures would not be helpful. Um, give advance notice about obstacles in client's walking path. Well, that sounds like a great way to provide for safety um, and um, definitely want to give them time to prepare for it or to respond to it because, um, you know, they may, uh, um, what do you call it, need some, some time to respond if they're about to walk into an obstacle or um, something's in their path. So I'm going to say yes. So I'm saying A and C so far. D, ask the client first if they would like help from you. So this one might kind of throw some people off because um, it's not kind of like the other ones. Um, but it is really important. This might seem like a no-brainer, like they don't get to choose if I help them or not. But, um, you know, with someone who has a sensory loss, there's a lot of trust that needs to be built there. And um, building that trust first through um, giving the patient choices and asking them. It's super key. So I'm going to say yes, that um, I want to ask first if they want my help. And I know, I know what you're thinking, like they don't get a choice. They do get a choice um, in perfect nursing school world because we got to respect their boundaries. All right. So then there's E, increase the amount of verbal communication you are providing. So if they can't see, I do probably need to provide more verbal cues because if I'm talking or verbalizing more, um, it's going to help guide them. So like this would, um, what this would look like is like, let's say that I brought in their dinner tray. I would give them, hey, the dinner tray is here. Your carrots are at two o'clock. Your um, meat is at seven o'clock and just kind of talking them through where things are. Like before I left the room, hey, your cell phone is by your left hand, um, like this kind of stuff. So I would be talking to them more because like showing them things or trying to point to things or like visually stimulate them is not necessarily going to be helpful because they can't see. So I want to like, in other words, I want to over accentuate the senses that are working because pretty much their, um, their uh, verbal communicate, the verbal communication I'm using is going to make up for the lack of vision that they have. So I think it's going to be all of them um, except for B. So I think walking slightly ahead of them, just give them my arm, um, you know, so that I can um, be of help to them. 
Um, and by the way, that is super helpful. I remember one time um, they had me like, well, this, cause this has happened all the time is I go to the eye doctor. They're like, take out your contacts. And um, <clears throat> one time I made the mistake of not bringing my, uh, my glasses with me. Uh, and so then I'm trying to walk from one room to the next. And I mean, I can, I can see big major things like doorways, but like, I had no idea if I was about to walk or trip on something. And so I was like, and like the person just walked away without me. I'm like, where are you? <laughs> you know? So it's really nice. Walk slightly ahead. So I know like where to go. Um, but also like give an arm because <laughs> I am so blind. So, um, if someone's very, very severely has fear visual loss, like, um, most of the time they want the help, but again, I mean, it would have been nice if she asked and then, um, cause I would have probably said, yeah, can I have your arm? <laughs> so a definitely, um, we want to give advance notice if there's anything going to be in their way, not just like, Hey, you know, like what do you call it? Don't trip over that thing. You just tripped over. Um, and then ask for them, their preference, if they would like the help. And then, um, and again, if they say no, it doesn't mean like, you know, there, there's a fine balance in real life. If they said, you know, no, I would just say, Hey, I'm really concerned about your safety. Um, how can we make this comfortable for you? Like comfortable and safe, Com comfortable for you, but also safe. Um, so it's not that it's just like, Hey, they, they're, um, cause you know, there's people that go out that should not be driving that are driving, but, um, we do want to always consider patients, personal preferences, but also their safety as well. Um, and then verbal communication is going to help to supplement the fact that they can't see. So everything but B. All right. So as the nurse, I am going to, um, utilize adequate lighting, um, for this patient, just to make sure, because a lot of times um, better lighting is going to help to supplement their vision loss. I want to decrease hazards in the environment. So, um, you know, I always want to do kind of safety checks when I'm in the room, make sure there's not extra cords in the room or extra things that are going to get in the way. I want to verbalize um, things that I'm doing or things that I want the patient to do. Because it also helps, like if, if they just hear someone in the room and all they see is this blob walking around, you know, um, which is what I imagine I look like. <laughs> but um, needless to say, um, um, you want to talk about what you're doing. So most of the time, regardless of vision loss, I'm always talking about what I'm doing in the room. Hey, I'm here to do this. Or, hey, real quick, I'm just cleaning this up. Or I'm I'm getting prepared for this. I've brought in some medications. This is what we're going to do. Um, it just also helps to increase their trust. And because you can imagine when you lose your sense, um, you know, of sight, especially, you know, you lose your ability to um, see what's going on around you. There's a lot of lack of control. So you want to try to bring back in some safety stuff around um, some sense of say, sense of security, I should say, um, around the patient. Let them know what you're doing and um, help to verbalize things for them. Um, education wise, if they are um, contacts or glasses, good hand hygiene, lens, glasses care overall, um, how to care for those. It's a lot of washing their hands before, how often they need to change their contact lenses, stuff like that. Um, just wearing sunglasses while they're outside and other eye protection, especially if they are working somewhere where they could have damage to their eyes. Um, and then there's a lot of alternatives for um, whether blindness or general vi visual loss for people that are um, blind, they can use things like Braille. Um, and that's where um, you literally feel with your hands. And that's how they can read, um, read signs and things like that, or they could read books um, in Braille. And so it's a different form of communication that you feel, um, you know, different grooves and dots. And it's, um, it tells them what, um, uh, it, it's a, it's like its own language. It tells them uh, the same messages. Um, support animals. So support animals are going to be, um, uh, you know, like, um, you know, that you can get like a dog that can help to guide you or um, help like, you know, you're holding on to the dog, the dog helps kind of like we talked about how, um, you know, the like the person being a guide, except, uh, you know, the support animal is there for you all the time and helps to make sure to avoid um, very dangerous situations. Uh, there are other alternatives like um, also I'll, I'm going to skip audiobooks for a second federal and state assistance. So if you are um, if you have full blindness, uh, there are uh, certain services that the government will in the United States will provide for you, like help with your federal taxes and things like that. And then additionally, there's lots of ways that people that maybe have general vision loss to help, um, like we talked about adequate lighting or distance, making sure stuff is close enough to us, because sometimes for people that can't see close up, um, you know, if you bring it close enough, it does help um, or decreasing the distance between myself and something else, uh, using magnifiers or zooming in. 
can be another way to um, see things that I might be struggling with. Audiobooks. So if I wasn't, I would have had a lot of trouble reading things, especially seeing small print. There's also larger print books. Um, and then um, text to speech scanners. So there's some stuff if I'm having trouble reading, uh, then it can read it out loud for me. Um, there's a lot of talk to text stuff, which uh, definitely makes things a lot easier. Um, I think that's it. I think next is cataracts. So there's three vision disorders. There's cat, um, aside from vision loss, there's cataracts, retinal detachment, and glaucoma. Um, so those are the three eye disorders. We will get into cataracts next. I'll see you for that one when I stop this video.